think we're live. Yes, I think we are live. So here we go. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Boz. Welcome to Sunday Night. We are back in hopefully a somewhat routine because it's been Easter and it's been funerals and it's been lots of stress on my end um, and kids doing all kinds of uh, activities that keep a mom busy. So I am really happy to be back on schedule and here on Sunday night with you. Uh, we do have Lachlan to give an update for the evening and I have some slides that I want to go through for some uh, lots and lots of questions that I've had in my absence and tried to keep up but as most of you that have been asking questions no, I have not kept up. So, um, you know, just some, some things that really do help me do a good job on this show is to say, hey, uh, where are you from? I have learned that if you are looking for a classroom and you use YouTube, it is amazing how far this reach goes. So I have students in Australia, I have students in Europe, and I have students in my down the street that tune in on Sunday nights. So thank you so much for uh, telling me where you're from. It does keep me engaged and really it just kind of connects that even though I'm standing here in a room with no other people, I am not talking to myself. I really am teaching a whole bunch of people. Um, there's been quite a bit of uh, um, uh, positive things that have happened with my book, Any Way You Can. So as most of you know, I'm a first-time author. I wrote a book for my mom. Think of them as the love letter I was writing to her when she said, yeah, I'm tapping out. I don't want to do this anymore. I've had chemo twice, and I think this game sucks. I'd rather die young. <laughs> and she wasn't young. She was 71, which was young, but not young. And she wasn't in her best place. Her brain was wrinkled and broken and had been through chemo and had been through a journey of too many long years of inflammation. And I'm an internal medicine physician and I couldn't help her. I hadn't helped her. So this book is what happened when I said, Mom, do you trust me? Um, there is something I've been reading about and learning about. And as much as I wasn't ready to do it in my mom, I think this is God's message to say, I want you to follow these instructions. And we did the ketogenic diet. So uh, when you write a book as an author, you can have a publishing team and they can do all kinds of amazing things, or you can just be brave enough to push publish on Amazon, which is what I did. Uh, and when I did that, uh, it took like six months for anybody to read it. But then when they did read it, they shared it. They shared it with their doctors. They shared it with their friends. They shared it with their sisters and their daughters and their mothers and their grandmothers. And I just cannot tell you thank you enough. I have between the audiobook and uh, the written copy over a thousand reviews of um, people saying how much they learned from the book. And uh, I'll tell you, it was a moment of courage about uh, 14 months ago when I did push publish. I didn't expect, um, uh, I had uh, so much positive feedback and so many people were helped. I could do medicine again for another 30 years and not to help as many people as I've helped with this book. But I got an announcement about a week and a half ago that Kindle selected a Mother's Day book uh, to share on their Kindle promotion, um, which I actually don't quite know what it means. I just know it sounds really great that they said, your book is a great Mother's Day um, uh, book to share and we'd like to promote it or we'd like to make a special of it. So in the month of May, um, it will be one of the star Kindle books. And I think that means it's going to be a discounted price for y'all. So if you're looking for a great way to read the book, it's just the best teaching tool. I love these YouTube videos. I love talking to real patients who come on my channel who have got relationships with me. And boy, um, it's not been a long journey uh, before other patients can see how much is learned in um, the, through the ketogenic diet and through this channel. But for those of you just coming to the ketogenic uh, diet or confused about the ketogenic diet, take uh, a back step and go read that book any way you can. You'll see it in the show notes. And it really is what supports this channel. The sale of that book is super important. So thank you for sharing it. People have reached out saying, how can I help you? And I keep saying, buy the book, <laughs> buy the book. That's really what happens here. It's um, it is an effort to try and write another book. I am working on some advanced lessons for keto ketosis, and I do practice those lessons here on YouTube. I practice them on my Friday morning meetings where I host a free ketogenic um, a support group in my community where if you want to learn more about a ketone and you want to learn more about the ketogenic diet, you can come to my group if you live near Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And the uh, secret code to get into the group is you have to know what a ketone is. Uh, but outside of that, we are really hoping that you've read the book or watched some of the YouTube videos and then you bring your story to the table and we help you through that journey. 
So um, thank you for, I've been watching the comments off to the side and saying thank you uh, uh, to all of those that have uh, chirped in and said hello and where you're from. And I just, yeah, the number of people that have commented on the book it is great. So thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so we have um, a few things that I also want to cover. On Sundays, I do start my personal fast that I started doing a fasting on Sundays when a patient said, I just don't think I'm strong enough to fast. And I said, let me do it with you. Um, and she needed, she was trying to get pregnant. Uh, she was struggling with PCOS and some high blood sugars, and she wanted to have a baby over the next year and a half. And so I said, before you get pregnant, your sugars are too high. You should, you should lose some weight. You should get that insulin down. And she's like, what's the fastest way to do it? I've been doing dirty keto, which was not my recommendation, but she'd been doing some like lazy keto. Uh, and I said, if you want to prepare for that baby, you've got to get that insulin down. That's the most powerful signal for that baby's growth is going to be whether or not mom has diabetes or prediabetes. So uh, we set up a goal of eight weeks in a row to fast for 72 hours. She's young. She was in her early 20s uh, or mid 20s. And um, the fasting lasted uh, 72 hours the first couple of weeks. Both of us started on Sunday. And at that time, we had my support group was on Wednesdays, so we tried to fast through Wednesday. It worked out okay. <laughs> I made it uh, all eight weeks. It took me, I think, 10 weeks to make it eight weeks for the 72-hour fast. There were just some weeks that I couldn't make it 72 hours. But it really started a habit of saying, if you want to reach autophagy, there are some numbers that are really important, and there are some habits that are really important. So I used that as a launching pad to set up a pattern of fasting every week, starting on Sundays. And I do a few things like um, I have a really nice meal at around noon, uh, and so my fasting will start about then. I will have um, some tea uh, that is part of my fast, and I'll drink black coffee. And I work to a fast to get a Dr. Boz ratio. Um, a Dr. Boz ratio of less than uh, 40. And less than 40 means that uh, my sugars need to be a little lower than they would have been normally and um, that my ketones new, do need to have a little pop. So um, I'm no different than anybody else. I got to check and prick my finger and poke my, know what my blood sugar is and my blood ketones are. But the reason for checking my numbers is that I really do want to um, hit autophagy each week. And I've had several people comment about uh, how how I've aged over the last year and a half, and they they've comment they said you're aging backwards, and I'm like that's autophagy. That's I, there's nothing fancy. There's no cream. This is a skin that keeps growing with less and less mistakes, and that is um, lowering my own insulin. You know, insulin is a growth hormone. Insulin does promote your skin to do funny growth things like moles and skin tags, and it's not a myth when people write in and say that ketogenic diet I. I lost my moles and I'm like, that sounds like snake oil. You must be lying. There must be, you know, so many people bragging or overstating the ketogenic diet. How can you lose your moles when you go on the ketogenic diet? And the truth is, is insulin is a growth hormone and it causes lots of things to grow that shouldn't. When you have excessive insulin, that will change the way your skin grows. So, um, I am about a month and a half away from a year of once uh, of when I started that 72 hour fasting on Sundays. I don't fast for 72 hours anymore. I just did that for the eight weeks with the patient. And then I set a goal of reaching at least 40 um, on my Dr. Boz ratio, which is a really strong uh, promotion of autophagy or strong confidence that I'm hitting autophagy. Um, and I like to at least get to 36 hours of fasting. So. 48 hours is my next goal of can I do that? But you know, this past week I've had funerals and lots of stress and I'm just as vulnerable when stress hits, I tend to go to some habits that are, that feel good and that can be sugar, that can be carbs. <laughs> so um, I did good during the funeral, but boy, just the stress of, um, yeah, death is very final and my, uh, my mother-in-law passed away and just what a blessed life she had so many people she touched and it's just hard it's a hard chapter so thanks for all those that were praying and for uh, the condolences of those that reached out so thank you all right 
So I have a few things that I was going to go through this week. Um, and in the meantime, I would love to see what your questions are. So some of the... Um, uh, the focus of tonight is going to be on fasting. Uh, Lachlan has uh, done her first 36-hour fast. Um, probably was, um, I think we're at three, four weeks now. Um, she'd done 36 hours. Um, that was her first fast ever. Let's just remind you about Lachlan's history as she is a type 1 diabetic. And to have type 1 diabetes means you're not going to make um, any, um, you're not going to make insulin at all. And as you, as you watch um, their journey, they continue to use my prescription. So I am looking for questions about fasting. And so I can see the feed of everybody's questions here off to the side. So if you have some fasting questions, uh, I'm gonna, I usually do the slides after I talk to Lachlan, but I'm gonna wait to see if um, I can get her sound working while I also uh, show you guys um, a couple things that I want to go through on my my um, my little slide deck here on teaching about fasting okay um, so we're gonna do a couple of things and I really actually hope Lachlan I think she's can, is watching now so I hope she can yes I hope she can see this because I want her to see um, the, uh, the these slides so the, the questions that have come over the last couple of weeks have been, um, where does glucose come from when you're fasting? And I have patients, uh, just uh, hundreds of them that have read the book and said, I really understood it. And now I'm looking at your book and I'm going through some of these slides and I really can't figure out if I haven't eaten a, a, a cotton picking thing in the last you know, 36 hours, where, why does my sugar, when I wake up in the morning, why is it over 100? I haven't eaten one carb. I swear, doc, I haven't eaten one carb. And this is an awesome reminder to tell you that, remember, the ketogenic diet is called a fasting mimicking diet. What does that mean? Fasting mimicking. It means as you study the patients from a fasted state, and we're going to show you right here one of the, one of the classic uh, studies that we could never do today. They would never, you would never have a review board sign off on this, uh, uh, this study again, where they fasted people for over 40 days. And uh, they did it in Minneapolis. I was rereading the study this past week, and I think it's very clever uh, or very interesting that when they were describing the people, they said, we selected highly intelligent obese people, as if to say that there's something about obesity and intelligence that's linked. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so embarrassing to hear. Uh, you read it, and you're like, cringe, no, don't say that about someone. Uh, weight is about a chemistry problem, and as soon as you explain the chemistry to somebody, you're going to see that people, when I did Lackland's chemistry with lots of insulin for the last year, and uh, ten, almost 10 years, she gained way too much weight, almost 100 pounds because of my medicines. And as we teach her this chemistry about a ketogenic diet, it is going to mimic what fasting does. Now, she adds another layer of complexity because she is a type 1 diabetic, so her insulin plays a big role in this. But for the rest of you, here is what these patients did when they fasted. The first phase was they had eaten a meal, and this isn't what their, their sugar was not 400. It is how much sugar is being burned per minute. Uh, or per hour, excuse me. So 400 milligrams of sugar was being burned per hour. As you look at those first four hours, you burn a lot right after you eat and then it crashes down. The next phase is something where the sugars all run out. If you had some extra sugar around, it would use glycogen. And glycogen are these little bitty balls that are of stored sugar. And most, mostly you'll reach to your liver to find them, but there's also some found in your muscles. And when you don't get a cotton picking thing to eat, just salt and water, you're locked in this uh, hospital up in Minneapolis, uh, you get um, the um, you get the glycogen to start being emptied in that second day. Um, when you get out to the um, end of your glycogen storage is when your body starts to produce more ketones, uh, to use those ketones, and then there's something called gluconeogenesis. And gluconeogenesis is something that is much longer. It is, it's actually in the keto world, they kind of use it to scare people a little, that they're, you know, you're breaking down your muscle to make glucose, which isn't quite true. 
Um, you got to really push the extreme to get your muscles br broken down. You have lots of protective factors in there about why your body will not sacrifice muscle uh, as part of its fuel when there's an excessive amount of glycogen and an excessive amount of fat around to be used. Um, so mostly gluconeogenesis is that, is that you're making um, lots of uh, glucose from fat cells, which is how you lose weight. So this was what look this is what the chemistry looked like when the patients fasted for 40 days. And if you watch that phase two and phase three are where we're gonna focus. So if you look at my patients who are doing a ketogenic diet, I teach them this is a fasting mimicking diet. So we put your body in a state of ketosis by saying cut those carbs to 20. Uh, carbohydrates are what stimulate the production of insulin the most. And when you cut them to 20, most Americans shove their insulin down and they start to use, they start to allow the chemical uh, messaging to be, hey, let's open up those fat cells and use them for stored energy. We don't get to use the fat cells until you use up all the stored sugar. The stored sugar is called glycogen uh, in the form of glycogen. Once you turn stored sugar into fat, the only way you get it back out into the fuel system is a ketone. So before we can tap into those ketones, we really need to empty a bunch of stored sugar. Well, a ketogenic diet kind of hits this phase two and phase three. So the first one is, I say phase two in a ketogenic diet is from two to 20 weeks. And if you look at the numbers at the bottom, it just reminds you that um, phase two was from 14 to 28 days. Um, when you look at glycogen though, you have to lower the insulin and you have to empty a bunch of the stored sugar during this phase two. And when patients are saying, doc, you know, I haven't eaten in two days, where in the heck is my body getting all this sugar? I have a sugar of 105. My sugar went up to, you know, some of, some of them in the 110s, 120s. Where in the world am I getting all this sugar? And the answer comes from your body in the morning has a signal to wake up. Uh, one of those signals is cortisol, which is one of your stress hormones. They call this the dawn effect. So if you ever had a Saturday where you were gonna sleep in, but you accidentally like left the window open or the shades open and the sun beats in at seven o'clock in the morning and you're like, no, I was gonna sleep in. But your brain said, nope, it's time to wake up. That signaling is part of your circadian rhythm. And one of the messages in that signaling is that you surge up the cortisol and it tells the sugar that's stored in your liver to come out of storage, to come out of that glycogen and circulate. Uh, that circulation of sugar wakes up your brain. Um, but you also get that when you've been fasting is you don't get the cortisol, you get longer and longer releases of the of um, stored glycogen. We're going to show you a picture of that in just a minute that's a little easier to talk about. When you look at the gluconeogenesis, it also takes much longer to be using fat as storage in the ketogenic diet. Um, it's not nearly as intense as a strict fast like what was done in those folks in Minnesota back in the 70s. In these folks, uh, uh, in my ketogenic patients, you can see that if they're struggling with high glucoses, um, and they've said, you know, I've been doing this. I'm trying to get my Dr. Boz ratio down and my sugars are over 100 and my ketones aren't very high. Uh, the next thing I'll tell them to do is to do a strict fast. And what we're trying to do is empty out the glycogen. So let me repeat a couple things. Glycogen. Glycogen is uh, stored glucose. So on many of my videos, I use these cartoon characters as teaching units. These little squares are used for glucose. And I have one glucose that's really happy, but the rest of them kind of are sluggish and they've kind of got some inflamed brains or some brain fog. Mm -hmm. And the message is to show you that, yes, gl glucose is where we get energy and it does make us feel good, but it's a flash in the pan for energy. And when you have more than a tablespoon of glucose in your blood, it gets stored as glycogen. Like, that's not fair. So as the glycogen sits there, it will store into a little bubble, and then the first place your body puts it is your liver. Your liver is one of the most charged metabolic organs in the body. It's where almost all of your ketones come from. And the longer you spend with high sugars and high insulin, which is going to be really important when we get to Lacklin, we put those glycogen bubbles in all kinds of storage pockets throughout the liver, and then when all the storage runs out, your liver makes more cells. 
yes, if you look at the size of your liver, it has, I mean, people say, what's the size of your liver? And they're like, how would I know? That's, that's a silly question. But the size of your liver really is how much has your liver been trying to either cleanse from your body or like how much alcohol, how much toxins has it been trying to cleanse from your body? Or how much sugar has it been trying to store? And if you've been a carb junkie for years and years and years, and you go into the ketogenic diet and you do this wonderful lose weight for the first few weeks, and then you're like, Doc, I don't get it. My sugars in the morning are still above 100. I cannot figure out what was wrong with my sugars. Um, I'm doing something wrong. It's this picture that I want you to imagine. This slide and the one that I'm about to show. This liver has lots of glycogen balls in it, lots of stored sugar. And when you go into a ketogenic state, um, that allows you to siphon off some of these glycogen bubbles. So if you notice this blood vessel, this has some of those red squares, which is glucose, and it has some ketones in it. So this patient is in ketosis. They're circulating ketones, and they still have, they're always gonna have glucose. You, you have to have glucose. Um, but the glucose isn't really excessive, and they've got some ketones there. But then the body says, hey, I need some more sugar. And watch what happens you will see the sugar leave those glycogen storage and empty out of the liver. But nobody tells you that. It, it's this hidden thing that's happening deep inside your system. And you're like, okay, well, I must be doing something wrong because my sugar just went up. And the reason it goes up, it could be stress. You could have a week like mine and go to some very intense uh, emotions throughout the past week and have a funeral and you know not sleep well. That would raise your cortisol, but infection raises your cortisol. When Grandma Rose was fighting her cancer and she was having chemotherapy, that raised her cortisol. Um, when you're happy, you, your cortisol can raise. It's an emotion linked to one of the hormones. But it does cause, it signals the body to release some glycogen. Hey, we need some more sugar. We need some more sugar. I can give you um, some of that, that uh, cortisol in a pill, and it's called prednisone. So if you've ever been on a steroid and, you, and the doctor will say, now watch out, it can really make your sugars go high. It's because that drug acts, it mimics what your body says for cortisol. And boy, that liver just starts releasing all of that stored glycogen. And there's sugars that can't go up to 200. It's been, they, they're very, very shocking. And if you do that to a diabetic, it's even more of a puzzle to keep them safe. All right, so we're going to add a few more slides that I haven't ever shown before, and that's to say, if you think the liver has a lot of places to store sugar, store sugar we're going to repeat this little lesson and show you what it does in your muscles. So this blood vessel is supposed to show you an abundant amount of glucose. So let's, let's just pretend you're a type 1 diabetic and your sugars were over 300. That's what it would look like. And you say, okay, that's not me. My sugars would never be that high. But do you know when else this little scene is going to happen? Is if you eat more than a tablespoon of carbohydrates, more than seven grams of sugar. And that's like a quarter piece of a bread, piece of bread. That's like a, a fourth of a cup of rice. Every time you eat more than that, your, your sugars go up. And your body does amazing things to protect you from that high sugar. First of all, it makes glycogen bubbles. And so if the liver seems to be crowded, the body says, well, we have all these muscle cells that can store glycogen too. And the reason you do that is so that when you run away from a saber-toothed tiger, you can easily access that sugar and your muscles have a quick, quick access to that fast burning fuel and you can win the race. So what happens after we put lots and lots and lots of years of high sugar and high carbs and never go into ketosis, you get your muscle cell filled with uh, glycogen balls. And, you know, here's another just an image to just remember. There's, there's muscles in your cheeks. There's muscles in your nose. There's muscles in your back and your shoulders and your ears. There's so many muscle cells that people say, can't you just cut out half my liver? Look at how much I, I, I still have high sugars. And in a ketogenic state, you're, you're constantly siphoning some of those sugars away. And that is the key to this. Um, when people have struggles of fasting, or uh, and they're fasting, and we say, if you're in ketosis, yes, fasting is going to be so much easier. But unfortunately, um, if you are high in, in, you have a high insulin state, uh, it will kill off the ketosis. You're, you won't make any more ketones. So here we had these unbelievable 
um, uh, options for emptying glucose. And patients come and say, I've been doing in ketosis for two months and I wake up in the morning and I cannot believe that my sugars are still in the 90s. How do I get my sugars down? Um, I, I've been doing ketosis for so long that I really do find the improvement in my mental energy, in my in my sleep, in my energy, in my immune system. But I've been checking my Dr. Boz ratio and it is awful. I, I can't get my sugars down. And so this is where I remind you, this is a fasting mimicking diet. And when we look at a ketogenic state, the first thing I focus on, and if you read the book any way you can, you'll see me say, number one, you've got to switch the chemistry. If you are a high insulin producing patient, if you've got insulin resistance, if you've had your weight on for years and years, and you want to get that weight down, okay, great. We're going to shift your chemistry, get those carbs less than 20. And they'll do great for two months. And then they get stuck. Their body stabilizes and those hormones are steady. And this time, we say, okay, let's try that again. I want to reset your system again. I need you to empty out some of those glycogen balls. And they're like, what is that? <laughs> the glycogen balls are, um, think of them as brown sugar. And if you've ever had that brown sugar that you had in the, in the bottom of the drawer, and then you pull it out after you haven't had it for a long time, and it's like solid brick, um, that that's what that's what glycogen does after it's been in your liver for a long time. It gets really hard. It's really stuck. And in order to use it as fuel, the easy ones that have only been there a few weeks are what your body's going to empty first. But to empty out those old crystallized sugar, uh, um, brown sugar-like glycogens, uh, it, it's going to take longer fasting. And that brings me back to Sundays are when I start my fast. And I start to this in hopes to improve my liver and improve autophagy in my body. All right, so I am um, I am going to, oh, there's Lachlan. All right, Lachlan. So did you get to hear most of the lecture that I just gave? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, Cause I, well, I think, so I, I okay. heard from when I hopped back on. That's what I've heard. <laughs> okay, well, cause I think it really dovetails into, you know, I, I was trying to think, was it four weeks ago that your first fast happened where we, you were cutting hair and you said you told some of your clients that yes I'm a type 1 diabetic and I haven't eaten in 24 hours and they're like are you safe to cut my hair <laughs> like what wait are you should you be doing that <laughs> you're right and yeah. and amazingly you lost eight pounds that week and um and you had some really good resets your sugars got a little better um even um even with I think there was travel the next week in that's when you went to Las Vegas and you said, I didn't gain it back. Is that still, is that still true? Yeah. Yeah. And I've done two more fast after that. And then I'm going to start another one tonight, but, um, so, so let's unpack like that a little together. T tell, tell me, um, the second fast you did, uh, just do again for the audience, how you prepared for that. Cause you are a type one diabetic. This is a lot to think about. Well, um, I guess I, let's get real. I'm just like, hopefully my blood sugar is really good in the morning. <laughs> um, but I mean, obviously it's much better these days, but uh, then I just give myself half of the amount of insulin instead of zero. Excellent. I give myself half. Mm, very and good. I, you know, I don't know. My Did you still plan like, for like on the busy days? That was something we talked about the first time saying, try to do your fasting totally. on a busy day. And the, the weird thing is, is that like now that I've done a couple, it's like I almost kind of accidentally fast on other times during the week. Like right now I haven't eaten since yesterday morning. See, oh, that's amazing. And, and you're... like, I would, I would be so many layers deep into my emotions had this been three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean like it just wouldn't even be impossible, you know? So you know like my mind get through it and that's probably the the hardest part of anything, right? It, it is. You know, that that biggest uh journey of what happens when you fast is um the sense that it's there's something so primal that says the first time you do it you really, really have to think about how can my body possibly get away with that? Uh, and looking into the, the bigger um, part of why does, uh, you know, why do I want to eat? 
and then slowing down enough when you're fasting to say, do I, do I really want to eat? Or am I eating because I don't have, I don't know, um, uh, I, I'm emotional or I'm stressed or I, it's in the, in the routine. So, right. so how did your sugars turn out the second time you fasted? Just share that story. So you cut the insulin in half. Um, yeah, like my blood sugar, I can't quite remember exactly what the numbers were the second time, but this last time I fasted, I was like in the one thirties, like the whole time there was no, no way. Up, no down. Yeah. It was just one thirty, basically, you know, one thirty one or one thirty nine, whatever, somewhere in there. You know, just, so just so everybody so else good. appreciates that because like, you have had, we started where your blood sugars were over 300 and um, we were given almost a hundred units of insulin a day. And, you know, you couldn't go more than four to five hours without eating. That was, you would have had a crash. You would have felt crabby. And, um, and in the end, uh, that first one, you were actually really worried. Like, are my sugars going to crash if I don't eat? And, um, so tell me how you're doing on your, your Dr. Boz ratios. Or your, let's just talk ketones. How, how are your blood ketones doing? Um, the ketones are good. Um, a couple of times it's been like two point something, which mm. I don't, how high can you go? Like what's, what's good question. High? Yes. So we, we had a, a gentleman in our, in our little support group who fasted for the week of Easter. So he did it for nine days and I made a bet that it wouldn't go above six, but his went up to almost eight. Um, and again, what? what yeah, <laughs> I know that's a lot. Bravo. I know. So his sugars got into the fifties and they stayed there. They were just solid lines, steady as you can find it. Like it's exactly what it says it's supposed to do when you do a fast as that your sugar should go to about 50 and then you should see these other hormones steadily rise. What's the highest ketone you've seen with that didn't have a supplement with it? Uh, 2.7. 2.7. Okay. That's, yeah. that's, that's amazing. So what that really does is say, yes, as the sugars in her type one chemistry go down, the, um, the improvement in her metabolism is that her cells now can use either a ketone or a glucose, uh, to fuel her system. And I know as much as it sounds, you know, she has a full life with kids. I have a full life with kids and, uh, you can say, no, no, no the ability to focus on all the things that need to be done and then to keep a steady mood. Um, I think that was one of my favorite first conversations that you said that I could not be doing all of the stuff that I've taken on and that I've, you know, really the, the engines are all firing on time uh, right. because of what your the emotional improvement that happens, even though your sugars are still, I mean, we're going to do an A1C here in the next few weeks. I think you're due for that three month report card. Yeah. It's going to be, I mean, I can't wait. I'm super excited because, you know, as busy as life is, um, this is why I interview real people. I, you know, Lachlan's world um, is a type one diabetic and I've been her physician for the last 10 years. She put on nearly a hundred pounds because of my prescription. And it's my goal to say, let me walk with you to say, you're, it's going to be really hard at first. Um, you're going to have a tough time those first few weeks. And we didn't really focus a lot on your food choices as much as I said, just keep having ketones, supplement with ketones because it will improve what your brain is getting ready to do. Your mitochondria haven't used a ketone since I started giving you insulin. Uh, now that's good because you didn't end up in the hospital, but what they, what we also sacrificed was that we lived at a 300 blood sugar for the better part of this last decade. And now to say, I want your cells to make uh, energy from both fat and from, from glucose. And I want to, them to prefer fat. So we put a bunch of ketones in your blood and we did that. And as we did that, slowly you started to say, geez, I, I'm not as hungry. Boy, my mood's really more stable. And then in the background, you're like, dang, look at those blood sugars. They're in the 100s, <laughs> which was an improvement. Right. <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> so what's your, what's your daily, uh, uh, long-acting insulin dose these days? Uh, 35. 35. Oh, that is really good. And so when you fast, then you'll cut that down to just over 15 or 17 somewhere? Yeah, like 16-ish. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay, so what's your goal for fasting today? You started today or you haven't eaten today, it sounds like. Yeah, no, I, um, I'm going to eat with Jax after this and then... Um, go until 
I don't know, either Tuesday when I wake up or Tuesday at lunchtime. We'll see. Perfect. <laughs> oh, and that's exactly how I do it too. I try to make that full day without eating, which will be my day tomorrow. And then the hardest part is the evening hours where I have to either have a full schedule or go to sleep because <laughs> I will cheat. I will right. screw it up. Uh, and then I also yeah. tend to be really crabby if I, if, so not being around my kids or being in a float or just not seeing patients for sure. <laughs> saying, husband, you're probably the only one that can deal with me right here uh, to, to have, have that fast. Um, but uh, it really is uh, that one day. And then again, um, so you, you had a, a pretty good, I don't know if you were on the show earlier when I was talking about um, the, the improvement in your skin and what people have yeah. said to you about your skin. Just repeat that a couple of times. So share, that, share that with the audience. Oh, just, a um, couple clients sitting there chit-chatting and they're like, your skin looks so good. What have you been doing? <laughs> yeah. I guess I stopped eating sugar. <laughs> <laughs> right. <And> mass quantities. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unfortunately, the rest of us, we lower our insulin by decreasing our carbs. And in your case, we get to lower your insulin once uh, your sugars are better and once you're in a little ketogenic zone. And, um, you know, that journey isn't something we get to start right away, but the long, the lower we get your insulin, the less growth hormone, insulin is a form of a growth hormone that makes your skin grow. And so it makes for smoother, what? less defective skin, the lower we can get your insulin. Yeah. Insulin is a, it's a, it's one of the growth hormones. Now it makes us grow fat cells, <laughs> but it also makes our skin grow. It makes like debris in our joints. It makes kind of some yucky things in our brain. Uh, so think of it as an inflammatory growth factor that's growing. Well, um, as usual, you are always a delight and uh, filled with uh, surprises. Um, <laughs> so do you have a... Uh, oh, so anybody who was held hostage by my technical difficulties tonight. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to go back to the to my slides. We're going to do one more thing I want to show the audience, and then I'm going to see if there's any big questions looming out there. So thank you. Thank you for dealing with my technical difficulties. And just thanks for tuning in. I know this is you've got a big life too, and you're on the season of baseball and kids and still trying to get your health in order. So um, be sure to Absolutely. take your weight because I want to see how, how much weight you lose on this next fast as well. So be sure to okay, take that, okay? All right, all right. I'll check in with you later, Lachlan. It's good to see you again. All right, bye. <laughs> all right, well, once again, thank you for just dealing with some of those technical difficulties. I'm uh, not uh, afraid to say that uh, there's plenty of things I'm great at. Uh, YouTube is still, I'm learning. <laughs> but I do enjoy the uh, improvement and the education that happens with real live patients. Um, there's nothing also like um, just the feedback that you get when you do impact their lives. So I am um, going to drive one more thing home. Um, actually, I'm looking at the time, and I'm going to skim over to some of the comments and uh, see if I can answer some comments. So, I, I, so Esther Barnett says, I get the same compliment with my skin uh, being so good. Um, again, <laughs> folks thanking Lachlan. Um, and just looking at some of the other comments about um, uh, how do you use the uh, ketones if you're not diabetic. Um, let me actually go through that because I have, again, um, there are, uh, this is what I call ketones in a can. Um, this is one of the ways, uh, let's see if I can do this backwards. Uh, there you go. Ketones in a can. That's what I put Lachlan on when, I, when she first tried to become diabetic. And the reason why is we wanted her mitochondria to turn on. Her mitochondria had been using glucose period, nothing else. And as a physician, I was happy she never went anywhere near making ketones because of the danger that she can end up in as a type 1 diabetic. However, um, we like to talk about the law of small numbers, and it's those small amount of carbohydrates that allow us to use a much smaller amount of insulin. The only way we can do that is to supply another source of fuel. So in Lachlan, I said, to start using ketones every day. I want to wake up what your mitochondria can burn, which is ketones. As we, she kind of dusted off the rusty parts of those mitochondria and she started burning ketones, her appetite went down, her sugars went down, she started eating less because of that, and she did some awesome things to her brain. 
I've had a couple other lectures that I've gone through the brain scans and how much you can wake up the brain in as little as four days if you do an extreme ketogenic diet. Um, what's most powerful about that is I do that same trick to people that are not type 1 diabetic. If I have somebody who says, I really should do that ketogenic diet, but I just can't get started and I, I, I could never give up the carbs. Um, the studies that look at how to improve metabolism, especially brain metabolism, which is my favorite part of the systems to talk about, we put ketones in their body and we just said, we're not going to change any of the carbohydrates you're taking. Just take the ketones. And that's what I tell my, I had a friend stay with our, uh, us during the family funeral this past week. And I said, just start taking ketones. Don't decrease the carbs you're doing at all. And what will happen is you will start to teach your cells to burn ketones. Now, they haven't done that before. And if you want to give up the carbohydrates in a couple of weeks, the chemistry that you will have set up will make a much easier transition, much less keto flu, much less brain fog, much less grumpiness getting them through that section where they wake up the mitochondria and burn ketones. So um, now this says use a full scoop. I never use a full scoop. I use about a teaspoon in a couple of, uh, maybe two teaspoons in a couple of uh, tablespoons of heavy cream. I spin it in some ice and then I sip on it. And you say, wait, I'm really keto adapted. Why would I do that? Because I have bad days too. I have days where I'm like, oh, I really need to focus. I really need to not, I don't want to have caffeine. I love caffeine, but I don't, I, I, I need to not have caffeine. It's late. Um, so this is a different fuel that just improves my mental focus. It works in as little as 10 minutes. Um, I mean, you can test it. You can do a blood ketone test within 10 minutes of taking a sip of it, and you can see ketones. And because I'm keto adapted, I can give myself that as a rescue, an energy rescue, instead of using um, caffeine or stimulants like you know tea. Um, but uh, and I find my, my mental energy is better. I also like it that it's an appetite suppressant. So by using ketones in a can, I kind of biohack my system too. So if you want to learn more about this, again, and the biggest support of this channel is this book. So if you haven't bought it, please check, please check it out on Amazon. If you have bought it, I love reading all the reviews. It is when I, when I have those days and I'm not sure if I re should write another book, I'll go to those comments and just say, okay, it's helping a lot of people. I just need to stay the course. And when you have a couple of weeks like I've had where, geez, you can't seem to plan for any more obstacles, um, I, the comments that you leave on Amazon are amazing, and I read them all. So thank you, thank you. Um, I'm signing off till next week. I hope to have a pre-recorded one for next week. I think I'll be traveling, um, but that actually isn't 100% sure yet. So... Um, until then, uh, again, uh, all the comments and where you're from really do help me know my audience. So thanks for tuning in on Sunday. We'll see you next week. And as usual, if you did like this lesson, tell me that you liked it and that you learned something because I keep tweaking the message for the next book. So thanks again, and I will see you next week.